Board members, we're back again. It's time for another faction-focused video, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. And today, as above, you can see it's the Lionkin faction. We've ran through humans, elves, dwarves, orcs, even undead. But now it's time to bring the pride of the lion to your computer, TV. Let's see, where else do you watch this? Cell phone, laptop, tablet, all that stuff. Maybe someday in virtual reality goggles, you'll see this in 3D. Like maybe this. 3D. See, like there's airships here and boat ships here. And All right, so enough about all that. Let's talk about these lions. A level one building, the first one we're going to talk about is the Colosseum. At level one, for a recruit action, you may replace any one of your serfs with a warrior from your supply at no cost. Okay, so sure, sounds good, right? No, it's phenomenally good. If I have a warrior in my uh, courtyard, and I wanted to field it, it would normally cost me two food. But instead, not only that, I actually de deploy them like adjacent or whatever, they march, right? Instead, for a recruit action, I may replace any one of your serfs with a warrior from your supply. So let's go to the big board. My capital building is here. I can replace this serf way out here with a warrior. I didn't have to march. I didn't have to pay the food. I just paid the recruit action to do that and get him all the way across the map. It's pretty huge. I, I am, I'm impressed with their ability to be across the map. I remember playing against the Lion King, and that was one of the things that I liked most about them. Level two, the Colosseum states for a recruit action, you may gain a warrior using the level one ability and still perform a normal recruit action. So rinse, repeat. We can, for that recruit action, we can put a warrior anywhere that there was a surf. I know that was a warrior, but we'll just say it was a surf. And then I can still recruit as normal from my capital board like so. It's amazing. At level three, the Colosseum states that your armies are plus one strength for each desert region you control. So it doesn't matter where the regions are. If I control those two regions, my armies are plus two strength. Now this is to a maximum of three because that can get out of hand really quick. Uh, there are, in a four-player game, there's only four desert regions. If you go up to five or six players, then you get the six actual full uh, island continents on the board. In this particular instance, it would be max of three, either way. That is the Colosseum. Now, w what would a good would a Colosseum be without a gladiator? That's right. You get to summon the gladiator, and his name is Reglus. In combat, Reglus the gladiator prefers the company of very few but alone is truly a magnificent and terrifying sight to behold. His image alone strikes awe and terror in his enemies who quickly realize the futility of fleeing. Their attacks land in vain against his impenetrable shield, and his sword falls on them swiftly as they scramble to hold under its onslaught. So Regulus here at level one, he straight up out of the gate gets plus two strength if battling alone. Combine that with the fact that you have two deserts under your control, that makes him a whopping eight strength all by himself. He could walk into pretty much any fight and walk out victorious. It's absolutely phenomenal. Level two, enemies cannot play the retreat tactic card. You have to announce this before battle. So if you have a level two Colosseum and you're going into a battle with Regulus, you got to let them know, hey, I'm going to fight you here. By the way, you can't retreat. So gird up. Here we go. Level three, you gain two victory points if the gladiator wins a battle in which your army had fewer units at the start of the battle. Well, that's his whole jam. If he's going in there with one person, i.e. himself, fighting your two or three or four, he probably could take on, he could take on two or three easily. He'd take on four if you had some sneaky tactics or spell cards. Uh, you'll get two extra victory points. That is Regulus, the gladiator, that you can summon if you have the Colosseum. Moving on from the Colosseum is the Divination Pool. The Divination Pool at level one states your units may march through desert regions without stopping and gain one resource of your choice for each desert you march through. Normally, as is indicated here, if you can see it, there's a boot on there. You can see it here. There's a boot right there in the desert region. It means you have to stop your march when you go through it. Not if you're a lion, Ken. One, two, three, whatever. 
March right through. But not only do you march right through, you actually scavenge one resource of your choice for each desert you march through. If you have the ability to one, let's see, go from here. Let's go top side. And we're going to march one, two, three, four. If I had four movement, I'd get two resources, and one from here and one from here. It'd be pretty phenomenal. Uh, that's level one, divination pool. Level two divination pool states that after you perform a cast action, gain one resource of your, cho one resource of your choice for each victory point the spell is worth. Spells have a couple of victory points, generally two victory points each. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little, but on average about two victory points each. Um, you'll gain one resource of your choice for each point the each victory point the spell is worth. So they're very um, resource efficient, it looks like. And then level three divination pool says that each desert region you control at the end of the game is worth an additional one victory point, maximum six. So they follow along the lines of the uh, elves who get victory points for forests and dwarves who get victory points for mountains and the undead who get victory points for a number of tokens in the soul uh, underworld. They do that, but we're for desert regions. With the divination pool comes the ability to recruit the oracle. This is Ari, the oracle. Ari's superior vision beyond the mirage veil makes her a crafty strategist. Her legions are privy to her clairvoyance of the enemy army's next maneuvers. With mystic intelligence, she can easily flank them into an unfavorable position. And once her prey is skillfully pinned, Ari releases her bestial might. So Ari, the oracle here, who hangs out in the divination pool, at level one, when the oracle marches, you may select one region up to two spaces away and peek at the exploration tokens in that region before moving. So in the game, there's going to be exploration tokens on these spaces. And she, uh, the oracle here allows you to take a peek um, at one region up to two spaces away when the oracle marches. In case you want to go for a specific resource or stay away from a specific danger, that oracle knew it was there all along. At level two, when you research, you may also look at one random spell card of one enemy who has units on the same continent as the oracle. So normally when you research, you're drawing cards from the spell deck. This particular case says not only do you do that, you also get to peek at the spell at one spell, right? One random spell card that your opponent has in hand. So you can kind of know what's, uh, what's coming your way. At level three, the oracle, when the oracle attacks, you can play two tactic cards and choose which to reveal after the enemy reveals theirs first. Uh, once again, the oracle saw it coming. That's very, very foresightful. Insightful? There's a word there somewhere, and one of those will work. That is the oracle in the divination pool. Last but not least is the temple. Well, last but not least for buildings. At level one, the temple says collect one resource of your choice for each desert region where you have at least one unit. So they really want to hang out in the deserts, Moving through them gets you resources, and according to the level one temple, hanging out in them collects you one resource. That's a pretty big advantage because if you have serfs, uh, go here. If you have serfs in the mountain and in the plains and in the forests, they're generating you resources. You can also have warriors in the deserts can also generate you resources. So that's a pretty big uh, advantage over other races who generally, well, actually, I, I haven't seen any yet that can pull resources out of the deserts. So you're, you're, you're usually locked down in these little circles are resource gathering spots. So when they're full, they're full. You can't gather any more resources. That's level one. The level two temple says towers in a desert region collect two resources of your choice. Huh. Uh, let's get us a lionkin tower. If we build a tower here in this desert region and this uh, lion is in that desert region, you're going to get three resources of your choice. Wait a second. Hold on. Let me think about this. Yes. You have a unit here. You have a tower here. That'd be three resources from this desert. But if you also have like any other units in a desert region, they're going to collect one as well. So that's pretty phenomenal. The level three temple says all your heroes are plus one strength. Eh, that's okay. Um, I think, like, if you figure Regulus the Gladiator, he's not going to walk around at nine strength fighting by himself. That makes it pretty, um, um, pretty amazing ability at that point. Some of your 
people aren't so strong and it's not going to make that big a difference. Speaking of people that aren't so strong, brings us to the monk. The monk is who you can recruit if you have a temple in play. And he's only a two strength. That's why I say that. Uh, when the temple is at level three, the monk is then a three strength. The monk here is Shishi. Shishi has given her life to the smoldering heat of the desert, developing a spiritual connection to the barren landscapes. Among the oldest in creation, Ogmore's desert spirits send visions to guide Shishi's tactical movements. On command, the spirits grant her a gust of desert energy and allow her transformation into dust so she can instantly appear to her comrades in need. All right, let's see how that translates into abilities. <laughs> oh, level one, all desert regions are considered adjacent to the monk. Mm -mm -mm. So this monk literally, where are you, monk? Where did I put you? Here you are. We'll literally move from here to here as one space. That's one, two, whatever, three. That's pretty wild. That's what I remembered most. Was somebody was teleporting around the board. It was the monk. Uh, level two, the monk may take one unit with her when she marches or flies using the level one ability. Okay. So we march together at level two. Now I'm taking the warrior with me. We both teleport. Super powerful. Um, at level three, plus two strength when a battle results from using the level one ability. Okay. Go back to example. Let's go fight us a lich and a... Well, that's not the lich, but you get the idea. Some un, An undead hero and an undead warrior. Okay. The monk may take one unit with her when she starts a fight. Just like that. Starting a fight in this desert because it was adjacent. The monk is now two, four, five strength. Now we're getting somewhere with that temple ability. Five strength. And... Uh, as long as the battle resulted as a, a result of this particular march. So five strength just for her and then two for the warrior. That's going to be, uh, oh, plus strength for each desert region you control. So if you controlled another desert region, the army itself is plus one strength. So five, six, seven, plus one for this is eight. So this is a strength eight army against a strength four army. Yeah, it's going to be hard to overcome. Make sure to use the deserts to your advantage if you're playing Lionkin. Lion can also get access to boats and ships just like anybody else. So let's take a look at the Lionkin's uh, ship here. That is their sea dock vessel called the Longboat. The sea dock level one says the Longboat is plus one movement if two units are aboard. So it goes four movement instead of three if there's, as long as there's, uh, as long as it has two units, just like that. At level two, when the Longboat ends a sail action on a shore region, any units aboard may immediately perform one free march action. Pretty good. So to kind of break that down a little bit, you know, on your player board, you only get access to so many actions. So this states when a long board ends a sail action on the shore, any units aboard may immediately pour, perform one free march action. So if you take a sail action with one, you get these little action tokens, and I spend one action token to sail. Well, when I sail up into a shore region, at level two, it says, not only that, I get a free march action with both of these. So if I wanted to, this guy could go here and this guy could go here or whatever I wanted to do and not use up another action token for that. That is pretty, pretty powerful. At level three, the C doc says, if using the level two ability, the army is plus two strength if their march resulted in a battle. So if by marching, they ended up fighting, if this was the case, they would come here and start a fight because of that action, then there were plus two strength for doing so. Well done, Sea doc The last thing to talk about for them is the Air Spire. This is their airship here. Very ornate looking air vessel. Let's put a couple of things in that and see what it does. Level one, when defending, before tactic cards are revealed, you may fly the glider and the units aboard it to another region. It may not result in battle. So sounds like you can retreat without playing the retreat card before the fight even starts. Level two, when the glider enters a desert region, gain one resource of your choice for each unit aboard. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. When you move this into a desert, you get to one free resource per unit on top. And level three, when attacking, before tactic cards are revealed, you may move the glider and the units aboard it up to one space to join the battle cannot exceed the region's unit limit of five. 
So uh, let's see here. When attacking before cards are played. So if uh, if I'm attacking here, we could move this into here. Then the region limit um, of five. So we've got one, two, three, four. So yeah, we'd be fine here. Um, basically, they get to move as a response to me attacking with this warrior here. The very, very uh, mobile faction, the Lionkin are. Um, my best takeaway from Lionkin is really, really use and abuse the deserts. Get those resources. Get those um, uh, teleportation abilities. Get, uh, get them going ASAP. So build that temple so you can have the monk. So the monk can drag somebody with them from desert to desert to desert to desert. Um, let's see here. What else is there? Oh, swapping the uh, swapping the serfs for warriors and like recycling them. So basically training them up in the field instead of spending resources to create warriors. You make the serfs, you turn the serfs into warriors over the course of the game instead. I think you'll come out A-OK -okay if you run the Lion King faction in Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. If you're watching this on the live stream, thank you so much for attending today. I really do appreciate that. If you're checking this out on the YouTube replay, thank you as well. It's also very much appreciated. Consider giving it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. It really, really does help me out. If you want to see more of this content, let me know in the contents below what you think of the Lion King faction, or if you have a favorite faction of your own. For now, that's going to be it. And as always, we'll see you at the next boardroom meeting.